Do you know the 14 traits of successful chiropractors? We've interviewed some of the top chiropractors in the industry and have identified the common traits that they all share. Jump on over to www.chirobusinessmojo.com to get your free report today. Welcome to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast, where we deconstruct the methods, marketing, and mindset of successful business people and chiropractors from around the world. And now your host, Dr. Richard Day. Hey yo, it is Dr. Richard Day, and this is the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in and checking us out today. Well, before we go too far, I want to stop and thank you all so much for supporting the show. We are continuing to see our numbers climb, and we could not be more appreciative. If you would do as a favor to me, I would love if you would go on Facebook and share on your timeline your favorite episode so far. We want to reach as many people as we can and let them really know their answers to the questions they have right now in practice. Well, I am honored to introduce our next guest on the show. Dr. Arno Bjornier graduated in 1977 from Sherman College and opened a practice specializing in infant, children, and family care in Yardley, Pennsylvania, where he served for 20 years. In 1983, he was named an Outstanding Young Man of America, and in 1993, he was chosen as one of America's 27 Best Doctors of Chiropractic by Self Magazine. His reputation for leadership in the profession led him, beginning in 1983, to teach adjusting seminars outside his practice on weekends. The increasing demands on his time finally led him to pass on his practice in 1997 and devote himself full-time to teaching others. Sharing his philosophy has become his driving passion. To accomplish that goal, he founded MLS Adjusting Seminar, Masterpiece Seminars, and the Cafe of Life Vitalistic Practice Mode. Arnold is still practicing part-time and doing two lecture seminar tours per year. Welcome, Dr. Arnold Bjornier. Richard, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm excited. I appreciate your time, and I am excited as well. Feel free to jump in and fill in any gaps I may have missed in your bio. No problem. Yes, whatever you want to say, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I was reading about you, and I've heard about you. You have achieved great heights in the chiropractic profession. Go ahead and share with us some of those high points and uh, some of the turning points you've had in your career. Well, you know, it's always difficult to uh, brag about one's career, so I'm not going to go there. Uh, a lot of people know me in the profession for my stand in principal chiropractic. A lot of people know me for having spoken uh, regularly. Uh, I used to go and still do speak on on most of the larger campuses every six months, sometimes at school assembly. Uh, sometime to clubs there. And a lot of people know me from a masterpiece training camp, which was a six day intensive training camp for chiropractor and health professional uh, that we ran for 12 years. Uh, MLS adjusting seminars. A lot of the students, a lot of the DCs have taken those seminars many times over. Um, so otherwise, you know, uh, I keep a low profile because I like to have influence rather than marketing myself and try to control the profession. So I like to ha to be influential rather than controlling. Well, tell us a little bit about MLS adjusting seminars. What are some of the things you talk about? Uh, well, this is an interesting topic. Uh, for me, uh, my body is sensitive. So when I got adjusted towards school and by many chiropractors, I felt that their hands were really heavy. I felt that they were wrenching my neck uh, rather than bringing the system into ease, they would bring the system to tension, either the neck or the lumbar spine or even the thoracic spine to tension. So I develop a way of adjusting where the system is completely at ease, where the vertebrae are virtually floating in space, where we take uh, in consideration the neurospinal system and the meningeal system and the cord tension, and then deliver very specific high velocity adjustment. So as a result, we train muscle memory for all the potential listings that are available within the spine. So that's one aspect of MLS adjusting seminars. The other aspect is I feel that we all have gone or will graduate from a professional school and we graduate as doctors of chiropractic. So we should be professionals. And when I look at the training, that today we're being given in chiropractic colleges, I say 
that's for neophytes. That's for beginners. Uh, it has nothing to do with professional training. So when I look at professional in sports, in music, in art, whatever it is, they train constantly and they train before the game and they train before they practice or they go on stage. So we develop a professional training to motivate and inspire chiropractors and students to train at a professional level when it comes to adjusting. So that's basically the essence of that seminar. Well, it sounds great. I can tell you, um, you know, I've been in practice about 10 years and, uh, it is very similar to learning an instrument uh, and maintaining proficiency in an, at an instrument or even learning a skill in a game like golf. It's something that you have to constantly work at and strive for. So I think that is a great voice, uh, to have out there in the profession. Great. Well, thank you. And, you know, by the way, many other people now have said have been my student or were on staff had followed the lead and are developing their own seminar with professional training. So it's nice because it's elevating back the skills of a profession. And I don't want to burn a lot of time on this, Richard. However, chiropractic is the only discipline that I know where the skills have declined progressively since 19, early 1960s. You look at tennis, the world champion in tennis in 1970 or 1980 or even 1990 could not make the team today in 2016. So all those disciplines have gone up and up and up, but chiropractic has been going down and down and down when it comes to the skill of clearing the neurospinal system and adjusting. So I saw that uh, about 30 some years ago and I decided to reverse the trend. So in your mind, is this the biggest challenge facing chiropractors today? Oh, no, that's not the biggest challenge. There is many, many other challenges facing chiropractics today. Uh, I mean, I don't even know where to start. You know, I've been in the profession for 40 plus years and, you know, I've seen a decline as to the understanding of chiropractic. Unfortunately, uh, there is still a segment in the profession that understand what chiropractic is. But today, the conversations that I have with students sometime is so on a different level and a different world than the conversations that I would have had with students, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, a lot of the students today, you know, want to be doctors. They want to be medical doctors, basically. Um, in many schools, they don't teach adjusting anymore. Uh, PTs is a big thing. And, you know, hopefully for them, prescribing drugs. So, uh, when you talk to them about chiropractic, they go, well, that's not chiropractic. What do you mean? Says, this is not chiropractic. This is what chiropractic is. You know, you diagnose people, you determine their condition, you treat their condition, you do everything to suppress their symptoms, and that's chiropractic. And maybe we'll have drug and that will help us a lot. So it's kind of disheartening when you come from a different place. So, you know, I don't even know where to start when you ask the question, what are the challenges that we have in our profession today? I think the challenges are enormous. Um, we don't have any understanding from the public as to what we do. Uh, we have created a lot of damage with marketing because, you know, with marketing, you can sell a crappy product. And a lot of people that can't make it in practice because they don't have the understanding they don't have the skills. They don't have the communication skill. They don't know what they're doing, can market themselves and still survive. But the impact on the public is highly detrimental. So those people, which in my view is a large segment of our profession, having, having a negative impact on the public, while the people that are really doing it properly, that are really conveying a proper understanding as to what is it that we do, are rendering a positive effect on the public. But when you put them in balance, unfortunately, one doesn't outweigh the other. So, uh, you know, there is so many things that we could address, Richard, on the challenge facing the profession today. Well, let's say you were given a magic wand and you could wake up tomorrow and wave that wand and fix the profession. What were, or just give me two or three of the things that would instantly be better tomorrow. What would those be? Uh, what I would say is the first thing, I think we need to have a clear understanding of what is it that we do and what is it that we don't do. 
what is the realm of our scope of practice? If somebody come to me and say, you know, Doc, I have a, a toothache. Can you look at it? I said, no. I go to a dentist. I'm a chiropractor. You know, there is so many different complaints that people can come in and say, Doc, would you look at it? And I said, no, I'm not looking at it. This is not my field of expertise. However, I have a network of professionals that I can refer you to for different situations that you can go see while still coming to me to get checked and adjusted if needed to clear your neurospinal system. So that's one thing. We need, really need to define exactly and be clear, have clarity as what is it that I do and what is it that I don't do. The second thing is we need to have you know, adjusting skills and clinical skills at a high level. That's a very important thing. We need to have a distinct product. You talk to, to the public in general and you ask them, you know, what is a chiropractor? You get 200 different answers. Oh, a chiropractor is somebody that's, you know, I went to a couple of times and they gave me a pillow for my back to wear on my car and a cervical pillow to sleep on. That's what they think of a chiropractor. I tell you an interesting thing that happened to me. I had a person that came recently to me and after the first visit say, oh, I am so glad you are not a chiropractor. <laughs> and I went like, what do you mean? Oh, well, because, you know, I have gone to those guys and they bake me and they cook me and they put ice and they put heat and they, they do paraffin baths and they try to sell me stuff and they want to put insole in my shoes. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a Walmart to the world. I'm glad you are not a chiropractor. And I went, no, actually, I am a chiropractor. <laughs> so <laughs> we need to have a distinct product. And, and that is called market differentiation. When you have a specific product, people know what is it that you serve, what is it that you offer. That's a very big part. The second thing that I see uh, that will help chiropractor in practice and the profession is that when a person comes to us, we need to have a very deep dialogue with them and connect with them and have an authentic, in integrity, in present time consciousness dialogue. We need to be clear as to their expectation. Can we meet them or can we not meet them? But what I see, Richard, in our profession is a lot of script to manipulate people's mind, to scare them so that they sign up and give you their credit card. Mm -hmm. And that is highly damaging to a profession long term. It may work short term for a practitioner, but as a group, as a profession, it is highly damaging. We need to connect with people on a real level, human being to human being. So that is a big thing. And I believe that today there is a great lack of ability to, co to communicate in a profession. The new generation, the people that have been in practice, you know, 10 years, five years, two years, they don't have the skill to communicate a clear message as to this is what I offer. And this is what I don't offer. And for me, it's very simple. When people come in, after I have a connection with them, after I have created rapport, after I know and understand what they told me, and I validated what they told me, then I can tell them that basically what they know, which nearly everybody in our society knows, is something called medicine. And there is a time and place for medicine. But they have to realize that medicine specializes in the treatment of symptom, sickness, disease, and pathology. That is their field of expertise. My field of expertise is life, health, healing, wellness, and well-being. Completely different. And obviously, they are not well-versed in that field because it's new. It's not something that society socializes them into. So then I, I have an opening to create a distinction and show them how that field called chiropractic can help them, not necessarily their condition, but net them. And I can also dialogue whatever problems they came in with. As you know, most people at first go to chiropractor with a problem, with a symptomatology. I can dialogue that symptomatology in relationship to one, what is healing? 
which we all know is cellular replacement. We all know that sick cell or damaged cell or disease cell can never heal. They have to die and be replaced by new one. So we all can agree that healing is a creation of new cells. Creation comes from life. A corpse cannot recreate new cells, but a living system can create new cells. And we also know that the creation of new cell is different. The rate of turnover of cell is different in different tissues. For example, the stomach replaces their cell very quickly, every few hours. But heart cell is 90 days, blood cell 120 days, bone cell 36 months. So people can understand that there is a different rate of turnover of tissue in different organ and tissues of the body. So depending on what they come in with, they can have an understanding of the time involved in the healing process and how by clearing the nerve system through which the vitality of the body, the vital energy travel, we can facilitate the healing process and allow them to function better. So it's important in my view to always have a clear communication that relate to the person's complaint when they come in, symptomatology if they have one, and how clearing the nervous system and facilitating the flow of information between brain and body and the flow of life force in the body will affect the healing process and will benefit them as a whole. So I think that's a very important point. Uh, the other thing that I see, you know, because you mentioned what's your magic wand to clear the profession or help the profession, yes. I think we, we need to have authenticity and integrity. And, you know, I hate to sound like the bearer of bad news, but I'm more the bearer of reality because I'm all, believe me, in my life, for contagious optimism. But I'm not a contagious optimist when the Titanic is sinking. <laughs> I'm looking at reality. And the reality is that we have new graduates, new doctors that have been taught by practice management seminar to have a script. It's totally inauthentic. And they do many things that are out of integrity. So we need to return to full authenticity as a human being and act completely in integrity. If this is the fee we tell them, that's the fee we tell them. If this is the fee that includes so many things, that's exactly what it includes. There is no bait and switch. So uh, I think this is a very important thing. Um, you know, there is many other issues, obviously, as you know, there is a political educational issues in our profession, but that will be hours of discussion. Well, let's shift and talk about what is exciting you the most about what you're involved with today. Ooh, what's exciting me the most is to be able to elevate consciousness and to bring forth a new paradigm. Uh, I believe that as long as we remain in the mindset and the paradigm that we are a natural fix for various symptoms or illnesses or problems, we're not going anywhere. I think our ace in the hole in chiropractic is that we can bring forth a new philosophy of life, a new understanding of the healing process, a new understanding of the value of symptomatology, which is a language of the body. We can bring a new understanding of sickness and disease, of the birth process, of the dying process, of life, of ecology. We have an incredible philosophy, and we can bring this paradigm to humanity and this new consciousness of learning that what works best is to have a pro active paradigm where people take care of themselves whether sick or well whether symptomatic or asymptomatic because in my understanding and my own experience chiropractic is a positive for human physiology the same way that I believe that nutrition is that practice nutrition and teach people to eat better wiser than eating the junk food that's available out there that good nutrition is a positive for human physiology. It's a positive for human being. 
Working out is positive for human beings. I could go on and on and on. Chiropractic is a positive for human beings and a positive for human physiology, regardless of the presence or absence of symptoms. So we have the capacity with our understanding, with our principle, with our philosophy, to bring a new paradigm, a new consciousness to humanity. And what excites me the most in my profession is to bring that value to chiropractors. And I can tell you the chiropractors that have been willing to shift their mode of practice from just serving themselves and trying to make money to instead turning their ears in a different direction and their voice in a different direction and seeking to help others, to serve others, to serve at a higher level than themselves and to bring a new understanding to their client, to their patients. They are rocking, they're having a great time, they feel inspired, they are passionate. Because if you think about it, Richard, I don't think there is anything more exciting than to see someone going, wow, that is a ha-ha moment for me. <laughs> wow, that is a whole new consciousness, a new understanding. I was not aware of this. I didn't know that. It makes so much sense. And if I look from a different perspective, I can see that the paradigm of symptom, sickness, and disease care, there is a time and place to address those things. But when you look at it in a global manner, it's a dying paradigm. It is not sustainable financially. It is bankrupting countries, corporations. It is eating a larger percentage of the gross national product in every country of the world. It is not the way to do it. The next evolving paradigm is to invest money in ourselves early on in life and take care of our being in a positive manner, in a contributing manner on a regular basis. So that's what excites me the most. Well, would you agree that the time has never been better for that message? I look out and I see a public that is fed up with traditional medicine and they realize that it does have its time and its place, but they are looking for answers elsewhere. Uh, would you agree with that? That seems to be the zeitgeist in the country right now. I do agree with this, but we have to be careful that we're not, we're not making it, oh, this is an alternative to medicine. This is just another band-aid or another drug, except it's natural. That's not going to go anywhere. Uh, and as you know, there is naturopath, there is many other disciplines that I basically have that approach. But we are a step beyond that. And when I look at the response of the public to the message of Deepak Chopra, of uh, Bernie Siegel, uh, I mean, you name it, Larry Dorsey, there is so many of those MDs that have a message that is very similar to ours. They are creating a bridge from the old ways to the new way. But we have to show up on the other side of the bridge as a profession. And if we don't show up, somebody else will. So that's a big thing. So I totally agree. As a matter of fact, there is a Hewlett Packer commercial that I picked up out of a Time magazine about four or five years ago. And it was amazing. It talks about, you know, the the business being a network and the energy and the information that travel to the network. And in order to keep it healthy, you have to make sure that there is clear communication. I mean, it was a perfect chiropractic message and it actually mimics the network of communication in cooperation to the nerve system. So when I saw that, I said, well, yeah, we're there, you know, the consciousness is there, but can we show up as a profession? and have a message that is congruent and that is consistent? That's the biggest question. Well, a big part of my motivation for doing this podcast is that there are, in my opinion, far too many new graduates and doctors who have been out a couple of years in practice who are, in fact, struggling. And it's my belief that some of that, the financial reality, is what is driving some of this bad behavior in chiropractic, people who are reading scripts and, and desperate for money to a certain extent. So... Um, what can we do about that? You've mentioned being more authentic. Um, what common traits do you see in chiropractors who are struggling? 
Well, there is so many aspects, Richard. One is, I believe that who we are as human beings precede what we do in life. Who we are as human beings precede what we do in chiropractic. So that's one issue. I see people that are passionate in school, that are so turned on by the principle, by the philosophy, by willing to help people. They have dedicated themselves with a parallel curriculum outside the school to train very hard and have great skills, communication skill and adjusting skill. And then they go into practice and it's a disaster. And today, as a matter of fact, I happened to coach a young chiropractor. He set up a beautiful office. He has a beautiful website. And nobody is showing up. And he has done an amazing amount of legwork to meet a lot of people. But the guy is completely shut down. So nobody wants to be around him. He has a persona. He's locked in an ivory tower. He hasn't cracked himself open. He's not vulnerable and approachable as a human being. So until that work is done for him, it's not going to go anywhere. He can go from one practice management to another to another. It's not going to go anywhere. So that's one aspect is obviously to realize that who we are as human being is number one. It precedes what we do. I don't know what else to tell you because I think this is like the dominant thing that I see. The other thing, you know, that is clear to me is that we need to have new graduate and new DC have a clear understanding of what is the service that they render. A lot of them are just like dancing monkeys. They are basically responding to the whining and whims of their clients, their patient, trying to fix them. And it's, it's a disaster for them. It drains their energy. Instead of being clear, I'm here, I'm going to check you in a professional manner. I'm going to analyze your neurospinal system. I'm going to determine where I should adjust you. And I'm adjust you if needed. And we're going to do this on a regular basis at first, because if you go to a gym, for example, because you want big muscle, what do you do? You go three times a week. And you don't go three times a week once and you have big muscle. You go three times a week for two to three months to have big muscles. Then you can level off. If it was yoga, same thing. You don't do one yoga session or one yoga session every once a month. You do it three times a week for a couple of months, then you can level off somewhat. So people need to understand, the DC needs to understand, have a clear, simple, concise, precise service. And it's not, you know, I see DCs that are great and it's everybody gets the same adjustment. Two dorsal, one side, the other side, the neck, Boom, boom, out. The public is not stupid. They say, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. What about getting checked? Do you know how excited people are when you check them and you say, you know, I only had to adjust one lumbar today or two cervicals, that's it. Or today your neck is clear. Do you know how excited people are? And then they are very willing to make another appointment to get checked and come in on a regular basis, on a proactive basis, on a well-being basis. Not even maintenance. You know, we talk about maintenance in a profession. I mean, who wants to be maintained? <laughs> right. we, are, we are living organisms. We are all about growth, evolution, development. Nobody wants to be maintained. Maintaining would mean that I'm staying. I've been under chiropractic care, receiving chiropractic care for 40-some years. It would mean... If I'm main, being maintained, then I'm the way that I was when I was 23 years old. And who wants that? So, you know, uh, I know that it sounds through that podcast, Richard, that I'm opening a can of worm, but we are not going to keep moving forwards by, you know, having a head in the sand and not looking at really what needs to happen and take action and become accountable and responsible. Well, that is it for part one of our interview. Check back tomorrow, and we'll finish up part two with the incredible Dr. Arno Bjornier. Thanks for listening to the Cairo Business Mojo podcast at www.cairobusinessmojo.com.